Welcome, welcome to the AI Lightning Lectures. Thank you for joining us today on your lunchtime uh, for what is the sixth in our series of short form presentations of 10 speakers, 10 slides for 10 minutes. Each is based around the theme of Unbuilt. And it's been really interesting for us to see each different interpretation of this theme from intimate insights of the design process all the way to research projects or campaigns for climate activism it really demonstrates the extent of the variety and diversity of architectural activity that happens even if it doesn't result in a built form. Today, continuing in that theme, I am very happy to welcome John Toomey, of O'Donnell and Toomey, uh, as our speaker this afternoon. John is going to present a selection of unrealized projects, a reflection on what might have been. So John, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Orla. Um, most of our work, like so many of you other architects, um, most of our work has been one of competition, but of course the corollary of that, the hidden corollary, is that so much more of our work has been lost in competition, and those wasted projects might be lost in space, but they live on in the mind, like Alice falling down the rabbit hole into Wonderland. Um, wondering would her fall never come to an end? Would she ever see those maps and pictures again? So they accumulate in the office on the shelves and I've learned to see that losing is a kind of existential form of learning. You learn how to survive, you learn how to keep going. So for today's talk on the theme of unbuilt, I thought, I might retrieve a few very recent losses, six competition projects from the last two years to show you some of the possibilities that have only narrowly escaped our grasp. Um, but, uh, but before we do that, I'm gonna show you the first competition that Sheila and I ever worked on together more than, more than 40 years ago now. Um, it was for a, little complex on a Franciscan monastery, monastery site in Connemara in the village of Roundstone. It's unbuilt, so it's still relevant to today's theme. Um, and the winner, the built winner of this competition um, was by Sam Stevenson from Dublin. So I was reading that the chess playing philosopher, Jonathan Rousen says, that we can be improved by learning how to deal with loss. Competition, he says, is a companion guide. It teaches us how to concentrate, how to appreciate human imperfections, including our own. So every time you enter an architectural competition, you know, you have to remind yourself in advance that however much you aim to win, you're much more likely bound to lose. And you have no right to complain if the ball bounces the other way. It might just as well on a, on a different day uh, by the same unreliable element of chance, it might just as well have come to you. So uh, speaking about Roundstone and Connemara, as it happens, we're still hopeful to get something built in Roundstone. This is a live project, not a competition. It began from an initial commission, if you like a personal commission from the great Tim Robinson, the map maker, writer, reader of the landscapes of the West of Ireland. And then following the news of Tim's death earlier this year, this project has now transformed into a, into a campaign to save the site and to save the Robinsons' cultural, uh, the legacy of their site from commercial development. So Sheila, um, my partner has, has written about this in the AI Building Material Journal, um, and she's leading this campaign to try to save this, um, the cultural value of this. But looking back on these projects we've done on Roundstone, I see some similarities. Um, so maybe, maybe one day we might do it. Now, I want to show you three projects we did in Hamburg uh, in the last two years. There are three extremely closely run uh, limited competition entries that we made in Hamburg. They're separate projects, but they happened consecutively through those years. So we've been working for two years on 
closely adjoining sites in three two-stage, actually two, two of them three-stage competitions. And they're all about the tradition of the big commercial buildings in Hamburg, the grand buildings that come down and hit the ground so resolutely in that, um, in that brick built city. The first was in a parkland on the river by, for uh, a big magazine publishers called Gruner and Yar, and it was a headquarters for their offices. And we were trying to connect the landscape in through the courtyards. And we came so close to winning that Gruner and Yar, but in the end, it, it went to Caruso St. John from London. And then the second project we did was at right at the very center of where Hamburg's uh, very sort of the old, that's the oldest bridge in Hamburg and it's the center of the dock city. And we were trying to make kind of connective pedestrian routes between the uh, skyline landmarks of the city. And um, I suppose one aspect of this that was interesting in this competition was they looked for options as to what to do with the existing building that you can see on the left, uh, whether to demolish it, which had to be designed as an option, or in this case, whether to retain it. And we were trying to re-inhabit it with a little tower of apartments that could live um, rising out of the courtyard. This competition was won by um, Bruno Fioretti Marquez from Berlin, and um, who took maybe a slightly different line, but not so very different. And the third of our Hamburg projects, the most recent of them last year, was um, on a crucial corner uh, between, this is the River Elbe, and that's the tower of uh, San Nicolai, the bombed tower of the church still standing in the main market square in Hamburg. You can more or less see from each of these sites from one to another. Um, we were emphasizing the corners in this part of this project because of the way turns into the market square and turns onto the river. And uh, this competition came down to a third and final phase, um, a question of detail really, between us and the eventual winner who are uh, Kristen Gantenbein from Zurich. We were struck by the intellectual nature, by the kind of the considered basis of these competitions in Hamburg. And though we didn't win, it was, a very interesting and very engaging um, process, a very demanding process. This is a sad story because we worked with um, friends from Lyon on a Paris, central Paris competition for a culture building as part of a larger urban development in the hospital regeneration near, near Jada and Luxembourg in the center of the sixth arrondissement. And um, the idea was to house a performance group called La Loge, who are a kind of a, a new force in night life in Paris. And we had to make these separately isolated uh, theater boxes. But our work then, once the plans were established, was to work really on the space in between, the space between the theater of the city and the theater, theatrical events indoors. This project was gonna get built in solid stone as a, as a, as a sustainability um, move. Um, and most recently, uh, in fact, right through the lockdown, we worked on a elaborate competition in Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in USA for news student center. Um, we were trying to make connections between the city of Baltimore and the student campus to try to open up routes between town and gang. And this was a difficult project for us to consider because it was it involved and necessarily involved the demolition of a good building by good friends of ours from New York, Todd Williams and Billy Chan. And in the end of the competition, last Wednesday, the winner was announced as Bjark Ingalls from his uh, New York based office. Um, it's, it's fresh news and it's, and it's still uh, smarting. Um, I guess I should say something about the project we worked on two years ago at UCD Future Campus. Um, we did it with Alison Morrison with Superposition and Platinum Bow Studio. But right at the center of our urban reorganizing plan for Belfield, we proposed this um, bare naked bone structure 
for a new school of architecture, our, our own, uh, a new home for our own school of architecture um, with interlocking studios and big volumes and external working spaces and the kind of integration of making and, and design. The whole project was intended as a lesson in uh, spatial principles and structural principles, as well as some civic presence at the entrance to the campus. But the jury report told us straight in this case that our design could not be considered a landmark and the brief requirement apparently for, for an iconic structure. So to end on a more cheerful note, um, we now have a new school of architecture to play in, in Liverpool. And the Liverpool competition was, I guess, a competition with a difference. Um, it had full student and full faculty participation at each stage in a three-stage process, leading to a final public judgment day with a presentation in front of an external jury. And this unbuilt project um, will get built. I might conclude um, by saying that it seems to me that a career, a sustained career in architecture depends on a combination of, you know, a cocktail of uh, vital ingredients, like an indispensable tenacity. And some talent is required, but a large degree of dogged optimism and a considerable component of, of luck, or you might call it um, timely good fortune. So I was showing these losses to illustrate not just the precarious dimension of an architect's working life, but also to show you that these unbuilt projects have a place in your life. Maybe the, the price that you pay to survive in this, in this job, um, the best job in the world. Maybe it's the price of privilege. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks for that. Uh, it's really great to see so many uh, recently unbuilt projects from your back catalogue. Um, but I did want to ask you, I mean, I know so many of your built projects are won through competition. Um, but I'm kind of conscious about how there are difficulties with competitions, I suppose, particularly in Ireland, where often even the winner doesn't get built. Um, yeah. And if you were in charge, and if you could suggest one change in the culture of architectural competitions or maybe procurement more generally in order to get more quality projects actually built, um, what would you do? Well, I mean, just preparing for this talk, I looked back at our work and I realized that 22 of our 30 public commissions have, have been won through competition. And I mean, that's stretching it. You might have actually say that more than that, maybe close to all 30 of our public buildings, but through competition, um, just looking at it objectively, 22 of our 30 buildings was uh, arrived at that way. And that, um, I can see that many of the projects that we won would not be possible for architects of your generation to win in the same way today. And I think that's a real problem because there's a complete overemphasis on whether or not you've done it before. There's a complete overemphasis on the scale and uh, you know the, the current state of your practice. Whereas you know everybody knows that the great buildings that have come out of competitions have been done from people's kitchens and been done by people who are doing those projects for the very first time. So I would be interested to remove as many barriers as possible out of the way and to allow the competition to be judged as an architectural competition and to be discussed and considered properly for its, for its architectural merit. But I'm very much in favor of design competitions. They refresh the field, they open the field, um, but I'm not in favor of the way they're run now. Thank you. Very well put. Does anybody have any questions for John? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask something. This is Shelley McNamara here. And 
uh, Harry John, and just to say it's an amazing breadth of work done over quite a short period of time. And I'm just kind of astonished at, at that breadth. And something when you were talking about Randstone and the past and the present, something that struck me about the UCD School of Architecture, it reminded me of your newspaper <laughs> office as your thesis. And I'd never thought about that before because I'd looked at that project, but it's kind of, it's like it's a kind of chessboard jump from, uh, you know, I just thought it had, it had something of that Russian constructivist, uh, a lot of that Russian constructivist thing in it. And perhaps your other projects are more steeped in another world. And I think that kind of diversity of exploration is really risky, but also really interesting that, that you, you, you move from one thing to another, but then you also jump. And I'm just wondering um, if, if you, this is a really silly question, but if you had a choice, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and build one of those projects, and I know the most recently last one is the most difficult always. But do you have a, a love of your life in there? Oh, I, I, I don't think I would hesitate here, Shelley. If of the things that I've shown you there, and maybe of more than the things that I've shown you there, I really wish we could have built that building in Belfield. I, yeah. I think um, I. My heart is in it, if you know what I mean. And I, not just for its purpose, but of course for its purpose, but I wanted to strip it all the way back down. So as to say, it's just, it just, it just is what it is. And uh, I thought that, as a school of architecture, I thought that would be an interesting statement to make. You know, it's a place that you look out from rather than a place you look at. Um, yeah. Okay, that's a hard question because you, 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 nerves are still, uh, nerves are still on edge, but it, it's, it's rough to lose any competition. Mm. But that was one I felt I, uh, I, I felt it would have been good for us to win. Yeah. Mm. Do people know about your newspaper? <laughs> at your office in O'Connell Street when you, at those, those days with your long hair and your uh, cheeky approach, which hasn't changed. What is it that Robin Mar Walker said to you? Move the site or go to another site or something. When I was a student, um, I, I was doing newspaper office with the modest ambition that the project would change the world, but um, you know, that it would be a radical building. And I, I was working on a river side site uh, because the Irish press offices were on the river and the Irish Times was near the river. And I, I picked a river side site and I was at a Christmas review and I'd done nothing except pick the site. And Robin Walker, who I'd never met before, came to the review and he said nothing on, until the end. I mean, I had very little work to show anyone. But Robin Walker, you know, took out his handkerchief and mopped his brow and said, um, well, I see that you want to make architecture with a capital A. So if you want to do that, you better get off this site and find a better site. So I went out for a walk after that and found a site that uh, at the apex of O'Connell Street, you know, the Westmoreland Street, the Lear Street apex, with the, the building that faces down O'Connell Street. And I made my thesis there. And I suppose you're right that because it was separated out into parts and because it had external platforms and because it was structurally disassociated from itself, um, I'm absolutely sure it was a family, family continuity in that. Mm. But, um, but our Belfield building was also part of a civic plan for Belfield as a campus. And we were very interested in the buildings that are already built in Belfield, which were being built, you know, when we were students, with those open ground floors and those, you know, with the mm. circulation connections. Mm. So I guess 
we were trying to somehow save the soul of Belfield mm. or repeat it back to itself. Mm. Well, it could work somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> In the future, we're not dead yet. Okay. <laughs> we probably have time for uh, one or two more questions if anyone from the audience wants to unmute. Alex has a question. Alex, oh, can you jump in? Alex, are you muted maybe? I can read it out actually, Alex, if you're having um, issues with audio. Um, John, Alex's question was, do elements big or small from a lost competition entry ever find their way into future projects? Oh, uh, hi, Alex. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, every design you make is, is a practice for the next one. And in a way you, you develop your vocabulary or you rather, extend your vocabulary by practice. So I'm absolutely sure that every building is, that you design is speaking back to the last one and is pointing forward to the next one. Even when you build a building and it's finished, you you're still have a restless feeling that it's not quite finished or that the thoughts in it aren't quite um, developed. So even when you're finishing something, you're thinking about how to do it again or how to finish it properly. So certainly you're balancing the ball, uh, definitely. And um, there are continuities in our work, despite what Shelley is saying about jumping. Um, but I, I like to live in a world where you feel you can start again every day, but you start with the kind of equipment that you have, um, you know, that you're burdened with. You're kind of, you, you, you want to be released from it, but but you only have it to work with. So straight answer, yes, yes. Uh, nothing ever dies. John, I was going to ask you about Lost in Space. Was, is, was that an aspiration that you might, that it's enjoyable to be lost in space somehow? Um, we have um, we have a book, you know, called Space for Architecture, and um, at the moment we're working on a on a second volume, which will come out next year, I think. It's called, it's called More Space for Architecture. Um, so, uh, in this, in, in the first book, we really just showed things we built, and in the second book, which will be showing the buildings built since the first volume. Uh, we thought we should include some unbuilt things. That's why I thought it might be interesting to show them here. So there's a whole chapter in this new book called Lost in Space. Okay. Um, and that, <laughs> um, I was in, I was in, um, I was in Peter Stotchbury's kitchen in Australia and um, I saw his cookery books on his shelves, you know, like just lined up and he had, um, a famous Australian cookery book called Simple Dinners. And, and then he had a book by Otto Lenghi called uh, Plenty. And then he has a follow-up one called Plenty More. And in between Simple Dinners and Otto Lenghi, he had our Space for Architecture book on his, on his kitchen shelf. So I, I, this was two years ago. And I saw that and I said, gosh, there you go. Look, Plenty, Plenty More, Space for Architecture. We should do more Space for Architecture. Then at that point, the publisher had gone out of business and uh, the artifice in London. And then they came back and they came back, they, maybe they were bought by another larger house and they came back to us just recently and said they wanted to republish our Space for Architecture because it sold out. And we said, that'd be lovely, we'd love to do that, but wouldn't it be nice to do another one? And so now we're working on more Space for Architecture because of Peter Stutchbury's kitchen, kitchen, kitchen bookshelves. Funny. So space for things is on my mind and lost in space isn't really about outer space, it's about the studio space, you know, which is a, which is a mental condition. <laughs> the other question that we asked everyone was, and uh, maybe it's too hard to answer with the current climate, but do you have any hopes for 2021? 
say I want my old I want my old life back. Um, uh, there's actually an interest. I mean, the monastic enclosure that we're all suffering is is an interesting. It is interesting, but it's very very restrictive, socially, mentally, socially. So I want to go to concerts and go to the <laughs> cinema and go to my favorite cafe and go to another city. Um, I don't want to travel as much for work. Um, I used to travel, you know, I mean, I was flying twice a week, three times a week, you know, to go to a meeting in London or and then to go to a meeting in Liverpool or to whatever. And now I think it's so easy to do those meetings like we're doing this now. Um, so I won't travel so much for work, but I want my old life back nonetheless. Great. Thanks, John. So it's the last opportunity from anyone to ask one final question. I don't think so. But we've, uh, I think we've made pretty good time. John, thank you for being so disciplined and sticking to our format. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, our lightning lectures, our next ones are next week on Tuesday and the week after. So we hope uh, you'll join us then. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you.